Okay, we were looking at uh, the Amida uh, number seven of the uh, Yud Gimel Midais of Rachamim, uh, which are based on the Pasuk and Micha. And uh, this is described as Yashuv Yerachameinu, he will go back and show you mercy. And uh, the Ramak interprets that this is a specific reference uh, to the teaching of Chazal. Bimakam Shabali Chuva Omdim, Tzadikim Gemurim Einim Mechaylam Lamod Ba, that the place where the Balchuva stands is a greater Madrega than even the Tzadik who never sinned. And unlike a normal Basar Vidam, where even if I forgive you, I cannot feel the same love as I felt before with Akadish Baruch, who's the other way around. When a person sincerely does chuva, the love and the kesher that a Kaddish Baruch Hu has is even greater than it was before the person sinned. And the way we trigger that midah is by feeling that same way towards someone that hurt us. Now this is a post-mechila. Again, you have to, as you go through this, you will note that some of these midos of rachamim are compassion when the person hasn't done tshuva. And some of these midos are how you respond to tshuva. So this is a tshuva response that uh, you should love the person because he was willing to um, embarrass himself, put himself out, to ask mechila, and to make amends. And therefore, in a sense, your love should even be greater. And that, in turn, will trigger the mida of rachamim, which is called yashuv yerachameinu. Yeah. That's correct, yeah. To what extent is that, is the going off the derech? To what extent is going off the derech? Yeah, I'm saying according to... Well, well I mean, uh, you know, even a small thing can be, uh, can be going off the derech, meaning uh, if a person, let's say, uh, speaks Lashon Hara, even if he's generally from, uh, if he then does tshuva on that, so uh, he has the benefit of Hashem loving him more because of his tshuva. If, if their tshuva was sincere, yeah. I, I, I mean, I mentioned before a famous uh, story where a, a bachor was introduced to the Gera Rebbe, and uh, the bachor learned in Ar Sameach. So the, the Gera Rebbe asked him, where do you learn? He said, I learned in Ar Sameach. But he said, but I'm not a Baal tshuva. So the Gera Rebbe said, why not? Why aren't you a Baal tshuva? What, what type of Jew is not going to be a Baal tshuva? But, but on the other hand, it could very well be, now, now that I'm thinking about it, even though technically, even the smallest of era, you have to do tshuva, and if you do tshuva, you're a bal tshuva. But I think we normally understand that the special relationship Hashem has with the bal tshuva is when a person has forsaken what you might call the fundamental laws of Judaism. Now, it's, of course, it's hard to be magyar that, but that would refer to Shabbos, Kashras, things that are very, very uh, fundamental. In fact, they have a story with uh, Rav Steinman, Rav Ari Leif Steinman, Aaron Leif Steinman, that uh, there was a kid who was off the derech. He came from Bnei Brak, so he came from a very religious family, but he became totally off the derech. And he went to talk to, his parents brought him to Rav Steinman to talk to. And Rav Steinman asked him, has there ever been times in your rebellion that you wanted to do tshuva, you wanted to come back to Hashem? So the boy said, yeah, I have moments. And he said, how many, how, how many times has it happened? He said, around five times over the past few years. So if Steinman said, I'm so jealous of you because for those moments you became a Baal Shuvah, even though you maybe lost it afterwards, and you were so beloved by Hashem just for those moments of Shuvah that that's something, a Madrega, that's even greater than a, than a Tzadik Gomor. Right? So that's the um, idea that the place where the Baal Shuvah stands is even greater than the Tzadik who never sinned. Now, the Ramak then is Masbir, just to go over this quickly because I want to add something to it. The Ramak is Masbir, the basis of this, meaning what makes the Baal Shuvah greater. Now, there, there are a lot of different reasons. He does not give all the reasons. The Rambam himself gives a different reason. The Rambam says that B'makam Shabali Tshuva Omdim is based on the fact that it is much more difficult to disengage yourself from the Yetzir Hara that has already gotten you than to simply not sin at all. So once I've tasted sin, once I've tasted the pleasure, so to speak, of eating what I want or, or driving around on Shabbos, it is a harder spiritual 
accomplishment to disengage from that sin than not to sin in the first place. So therefore, the greatness of the Baal Shuba is that he has to fight his Yetzir Hara on a greater level, meaning the, the thing that the Maila is that he has to do more. Now, the Ramak says it a little differently, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain the difference. So the Rambam says it's based on Yitzro Miskaber. The Yetzir Hara is stronger, and therefore the accomplishment is greater. That's what the Rambam says in Hilchus Tshuva. Others say that it's not so much the Yetzirah is greater, but that the passion for connecting to God is greater. Because when one lost something, that's why I mentioned it's the person who had it and lost it, then their yearning and their desire to be connected is stronger than the person who never lost it. By the way, that's a machshava for Tisha B'Av generally. Uh, and that is, you know, Shakespeare said, I believe it was Shakespeare, absence makes the heart grow fonder. That is, sometimes the more we are separated from something, the greater is our yearning to be connected to it. Someone asked Rav Huttner when he made Aliyah, when he came to Eretz Yisrael, I'm not sure if he ever made Aliyah, but when he came to Eretz Yisrael for his last years, he was asked, was there anything that he missed about Chutz Oretz? <laughs> so Rav Huttner said, yeah. The one thing I missed about Chutz Aretz was my yearning to come to Eretz Yisrael. Now that's a very deep remark because a person is living in Chutz Aretz and a person dreams about coming to Eretz Yisrael and they're obsessed with it and they think about it day and night. When will I come? When will I be Zoha to come? And their mind and their heart is, are so makushar to Eretz Yisrael. But then you come here and you know, life is life. I mean, I always, you know, I, not that I intentionally eavesdrop, but I'm on, I'm on the light rail a lot. Uh, and I hear people talk. I hear tourists talk about, you know, okay, we're going to the Kotel at 2 and at, at 2.30, we're going to go to this great Thai restaurant in the, in the old city or something. Like, you know, life is a series of nice vacation events. Okay, again, someone's here on vacation. I don't begrudge it. Let them enjoy vacation. But real life is not vacation. And you know, once you're living here, you know, there are the frustrations of life. And sometimes a person doesn't appreciate Eretz Yisrael. And the paradox is, you may have been more emotionally connected to Eretz Yisrael when you weren't living here than when you are living here. The absence generates a tremendous passion for closeness. So some want to say that that is the idea of why the Baal Shuvah might be greater than the Tzadik Gomer, because the Baal Shuvah had that distance from God. Now maybe they didn't realize it at the time. Or maybe they did. That, that may have been what brought them to Tshuva. And as a result, their passion to be connected to HaKadosh Baruch is a stronger passion than maybe the FFB who never had a sense of being separated from Hashem in that way. Right? So there are two explanations so far why the Baal Tshuva might be greater than the Tzaddik the other is that he has to fight his Yetzir Hara in a more intensive way. And the other is the yearning and the passion that comes from the distance from Hashem. Maybe a stronger yearning and passion than the person who just takes things for granted. You can take anything granted. You can take the Beis HaMikdash for granted, for sure. I remember reading, I mean, it was a fictional biography, but um, um, this was a Chashva Rav. Actually, he actually was a Rav in, in, in Germany in the time of Rav Hirsch, Rav Meir Lehman. And he wrote Svarim too. But one of the things he did to be Makarov people was he wrote like children's novels, historical novels, based on Chazal and the like, so ki in German. So kids could read it and they could be inspired in various ways. So he actually wrote a fictional historical novel based on the life of Rabbi Akiva based on the life of Rabbi Akiva. And again, it's all based on Chazal, but it's not footnoted. It's, it's written like a conversational novel. So obviously, the, the words are not exact quotations. So he was describing Rabbi Akiva's wife, Rachel, when she was a young girl. She was still a very righteous girl. So uh, one of the scenes, I still remember this, it's very funny, but it strikes you as, strikes me as true in some ways. Uh, the girls were deciding how they should spend a certain afternoon. They didn't have household duties. 
So one of the girls said, well, let's go to the base of Mikdash and watch the Korbanos. So the other girl said, you know, that's boring. It's always the same thing every day. Uh, let's go shopping instead. <laughs> so you see, let's go to the base of Mikdash to watch Korbanos. Ah, nah, we, you know, shopping is more fun. So you see, you have a base of Mikdash. You can take the base of Mikdash for granted, uh, granted as well. So the Baal Shuba doesn't take, the, see, the Baal Shuba does not take things for granted because the Baal understands what it was like not to live a life of Torah, right? So that's the second reason why the place where the Baal is is greater than the tzaddik who never sinned. He doesn't take it for granted. I think I mentioned to you uh, the famous uh, speech in uh, Lincoln Square. Um, it's, it's, I think it's on the internet. I think you could see it on YouTube by Hillel Gross, who was an Askan who was involved in Kiruv Rechokim. This was maybe 30 years ago, a long time ago already. But uh, he was a, the honoree at Rabbi Ephraim Buchwald's uh, Jewish outreach program. And his speech was called, Why I Hate Balei Tshuva. Now, of course, he was using Balei Tshuva in the way we use it, people who became uh, from, not, not necessarily going off the derech. And the speech was called, Why I Hate Balei Tshuva. And basically, he was saying things like that when I come home Friday night, uh, my only desire is to have a 15-minute seuda and then go to sleep right away. And I have all these balei tshuva over, and they want to vort on the parsha, and they want to sing zemiros. And if I skip one of the zemiros, oh, why don't you sing this one? And his point basically was that they, maybe we're stereotyping, they approach Yiddishkeit with enthusiasm, uh, with yearning, as opposed to people who take it for granted. You know, we've, done, we've been there, done that already. So these are the two basic explanations of why b'makam shabali tshuva aimdim serigim gemurim einem echel olama. But now the Ramak does not bring those other explanations. The Ramak brings a third explanation based on, again, I'm chazering a little bit, based on the Gemara in Masech Shabbos. By the way, the passage in that Gemara is bichlal, very, very interesting, because it doesn't only talk about hay, it actually goes through, it doesn't go through the whole olive base. Unfortunately, this is an example that you'll often find in the Gemara of truncated agada, in which we don't have the, the rest. I mean, one example is the Yud Gimel Midos themselves. The, not, not the ones in Micha, but the ones of Moshe. The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah explains Hashem, Hashem, and Kale Rachum, and it doesn't explain the other ones. Now, we have to assume that Mistama, there was a Brisa that went through all of them, but since we don't have a separate book of Brisas, we only know the Brisas fundamentally from that which is quoted in the Gemara or that which is in the Tosefta or whatever it is. So the truth of the matter is, there are many Mamare Chazal that we don't have, meaning incomplete. So the Yud Gimel Midos is an example. Um, in fact, uh, another example, although it's a bit of a subtle example, is uh, we know that there were 24, also no Gaeta Tishba, we are 24 Mishmaras of Kohanim. The Kohanim had 24 watches. Each Mishmar did the Avaita for a week, and after the 24 weeks, it would start again. And except on the Yomim Tovim, all the Mishmaras would come to do the Avaita. And uh, the names of these Mishmaras are given in Divrei Hayamim. We know the names of these 24 Mishmaras. And the Yerushalmi has a drasha on the symbolic spiritual meaning of the Mishmaras, but it only gives you two of them. It says, this Mishmar is because of this, and this Mishmar is because of that. Well, what about the other 22 Mishmaras? Now, the answer is, it's a lost brysa. So the Gemara in Masech Shabbos has a brysa that is going over the letters of the Aleph base. What does Aleph rep? So it says, um, Aleph base, right? So it says, look at the names of the letters as if they're words. Aleph base is an abbreviation. Aluf, well, that's almost the whole word. Bina, learn understanding. Gimel Dalid is an abbreviation. Gamol Dalim. Give charity or do chesed to the poor. Right? Aluf bina, learn understanding. Gamol dalim. And then it takes you to the hay. Now, the hay is the first one where we focus on the shape of the letters. Until then, we were focusing on the name of the letters. But then it doesn't carry through. 
Like it doesn't tell me what Samach is, it doesn't tell me what Sadik is, etc. So once again, uh, Behechrich, what's going on here is, it probably was a truncated Brisa that we lost. So you can look at Mesecha Shabbos about other letters as well. But in particular, uh, the Tamar Devaira is only bringing the letter He. Okay? And the letter He is Daima Liach Sadra. It uh, resembles uh, an open porch, a portico, right? Because a port, these, these, what's called an achsadra, which is actually a Greek word, uh, is that it has three walls, or maybe the back wall is the wall of the house, but three walls, open in front, right? The hay is an achsadra, although the opening is at the bottom. And the answer is that Ayla Maza is like an achsadra, because anybody can fall through the bottom. It's very easy to simply lose your footing in this world. It's like you're walking on air. You can fall any time. But the reason why it's open on the upper left is that even if you've fallen, you're always given the chance of doing tshuva and re-entering this world in a proper way uh, of serving Hashem. So the Gemara then asks, well, if it's open at the bottom and I fall down, let me just enter the same way. The answer is, the Gemara says, he who sins cannot enter the same way that he fell because he's going to fall again. He has to elevate himself, go to a higher place and enter. Right? So that's the Gemara. So the Ramak understands this to mean that the Baal Tshuva has to live at a higher level than the person who never sins, simply because if he would simply go back to what he was, meaning from, he was from, we're going back with that definition of Baal Tshuva, <coughs> if he simply says, I'm gonna do Tshuva and be exactly the way I was before I sinned, not gonna work because the way he was before he sinned, he fell. So what makes the Baal Tshuva higher, according to the Ramak, it's a little different than, than the Rambam and the other reason, is not necessarily the passion or the yearning or even the struggle with the Yetzir Hara per se, but the fact that by definition, his behavior needs to be at a higher level. Now, what that means is, of course, in a way that's a pretty strict definition because what that means is, it's not the automatic fact that you're a Baal Shuba that makes you so beloved. It's the fact that as a consequence of being a Baal Shuba, I have to live on a higher madrig. You see, that's very different. Meaning, that's not an automatic thing. Vishlama, the other way, that it's a bigger accomplishment that I'm fighting my Yetzir Hara. So any Baal Shuba is going to have that. And even like the Rambam, that the notion is, since I sense the absence of God, the state of being a Baal Shuba generates a passion. In other words, that's an integral aspect of being a Baal Shuba. Like the Ramak, it's not the Baal Tshuva that gained you the status. It's the behavioral adjustments that you need to have that elevate you above the Tzaddik. Which means not everybody is going to be there in that level. But that's how the Ramak understands it, based on the Gemara in Maseches Shabbos, that the one who enters the hay, meaning enters the world, enters the living Jewish Torah world must do so at a higher level than the level in which he fell. Just to go back to where you were is not going to help you. you got to go to a higher, higher place. Th then he brings a passage from the Zohar, which we're not going to elaborate now because he's marich on it later. He really just alludes to it here. That the very word tshuva, the Zohar says, is broken up into two words. Tashuv hey, the hey goes back. The hey goes back. So really, it's really you go back into the hey, but the sense is the hey comes back to you, meaning when you do tshuva, you were separated from the hey, and now you're back in the hey. Now the hey itself is connected to the shame havaya, and therefore you're connected to God once again. And of course, it's a complicated thing because there are two hays in the Shem Havaya. There's Yud and a hay, and a Vav and a hay. And uh, the Zohar says, some types of tshuva only restore the lower hay, 
the second hay. And some types of tshuva restore the higher hay. And uh, the, that one tshuva is called tshuva ilah, elevated tshuva. And one tshuva is called tshuva tata, lower tshuva. And uh, when the lower hay is repaired, that's called lower tshuva. And when the higher hay is prepared, that's called upper tshuva. And uh, the meaning of that will, will, will defer for now. But uh, those of you that are students of Tanya, if, if there are such, uh, know that the third section of Tanya is called the Geres HaTshuva, the Alter Rebbe's letter about tshuva. And the whole Igeres HaTshuva, which is not so big, is about explaining what is higher tshuva and what is lower tshuva based on the Kabbalah idea of restoring the hay. Because again, the notion is this. When you sin, it's not simply that you fall off the hay, out of the hay, but you dislocate, so to speak, the hay from the Shem Havaya itself. So it affects the Shefa of Bracha coming into the world. And sometimes your dislocation is at the higher level, sometimes it's at the lower level. But when you repair it, you want to repair it at both at both levels. Again, this may not make a lot of sense right now. Uh, we, we will get to it later. Uh, but the Ramak does allude to the fact that Teshuvah is comprised of the uh, two words, Toshuv Hay, the Hay returns to its being, its being dislocated. So Biderach Agav, I just want to share with you um, something else about the Hay, which has nothing to do with the Ramak, and the Ramak is not going in this Mahalik at all. But it is from the uh, Maharal. So it's Kedai to uh, just be aware of it as a general idea. Again, we go back to the idea <coughs> that Olam Haba was created through the spiritual force of the letter Yud. And Olam Hazah was created through the spiritual force of the letter He. And the Gemara gave a reason. Why is Olam Hazah Daima Liach Sadra? Okay. So the Maral has a different approach, which really does not work with the Gemara and Shabbos. It's interesting that he's not going with the Gemara and Shabbos at all. He basically says that He represents a composite of two letters. Yud represents Olam Haba because it's spiritual. Yud is least material of any letter. It's the smallest of all letters. A letter, by definition, has to have some finite space, but this is as little as you can have. What is a hay? So he says a hay is a composite of a dalit and a yud. I would have thought a dalit and a vav, but he says it's a dalit and a yud. And in truth, by the way, if you look at, next time you get an aliyah, if you look at the way a hay is written in Kisava Shuris, um, the, 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 the leg of the hay, on the left side, does look like an upside down yud. It, it comes down, and in other words, it doesn't. It's not a straight vav. Uh, it actually is a yud-shaped letter, although it's upside down. So the moral says that the uh, hey is dalid and yud. What is the significance of dalid and yud? If yud represents spirituality, dalid represents pure materialism. Why? Because there are four directions, north, south, east, west. There are four, di four basic dimensions of matter. We have length, we have width, uh, we have uh, thickness, and we have time. So Einstein didn't invent this idea. The idea that uh, time is an aspect of matter in a time-space continuum was not invented by Einstein. In fact, it was not invented by Maral either. I mean, uh, it goes back even to Greek philosophy and the like. And Chazal certainly spoke about zaman as being connected to matter. And that's why uh, many Meforshim say, in the beginning of the Torah, when it says, Bereshis bara Elohim, uh, in the you know, so, so instead of saying, in the beginning, God created, it's interpreted, God created Bereshis. God created beginning, meaning God created time. Time is a creation. Now, we don't even know what that means. What does it mean that a world without time? It's, it's, it's not, or there was no world actually. What, what does it mean to have a timeless state of something? We don't even understand because we live in a world of matter. But in fact, as Einstein himself uh, recognized, time and matter 
are inextricably linked. Therefore, four equals materialism because you have four perceptible dimensions. Again, I mean, physicists say there may be 23 dimensions, but um, in terms of normal perception, we perceive, so to speak, four dimensions of reality, uh, length, width, uh, breadth, or thickness, and time. So here's the thing. If Yud represents pure spirituality, and Dalit, which is four, represents pure materialism, what is He? He is bringing spirituality into a material world. And that is the avoda of Olam Hazah, to bring Ruchnias, to be Megala Hashem, in the Olam Hagashmi. So the Yud is the Olam of Ruchni. There's no time, there's no matter. There are no spatial dimensions, there's no materialism. Remember, our idea of Olam Haba, as the Rambam explains, there is nothing physical in Olam Haba. Even though Chazal talk about eating and drinking and the like, those are mishalim, those are just parables or metaphors for the spiritual connection of an Hashemah to God. There's no eating and drinking in Olam Haba. Olam Haba is purely spiritual. Unlike Tchiyas Amazim, that's a separate thing, but Olam Haba is, has no physical component whatsoever. But Olam Hazeh, what is our tafkid? To bring Kedusha, Yud, into the physicality of this world. And that's a very important yesod in Yiddishkeit, that we do not believe that holiness is escaping the physical. For example, let's take Christianity. Christianity, or at least no Catholicism, might say, ideally, a holy person should not get married. That's why a priest should be celibate. Elamai, like Paul said, ah, there's a concession that the average guy could get married because better to marry than to burn in hell. That's actually what Paul writes uh, there. So marriage itself is a concession to human weakness. Ideally, a holy person should take a vow of poverty. Right? In other words, the, the idea of holiness among many religions is asceticism, renunciation, separation from olam hazeh, because the world is evil and the world will drag you down. Uh, Judaism says the other way around. Judaism says that the physicality of this world might be neutral. You can use it for good things or use it for bad things. Your job is to bring holiness into the physical. That is why the Torah is so concerned with physical actions. Like you might think, well, gee, why don't I serve God by meditation and only by Torah study, just using my mind? Why do I got to put these leather straps on my arm? Uh, why do I have to do so many physical things? Like what is the purpose? And the answer is because we want leather and we want wool and we want uh, plants, all of these different things. We want meat to be taken and elevated and consecrated and used to serve God. Eating, drinking, procreation, sexual relations. You sanctify, you elevate them to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You don't escape them, you don't reject them. You embrace them, but you embrace them with a purpose. I eat, but I make a bracha. I eat so I can uh, learn Torah or serve Hashem. And then as the Rambam writes, the eating and the drinking and the basketball playing and the jogging all become avodas Hashem because you've taken what would have been a mundane activity and you've used it as a source to bring holiness into your life and the like. And the Rambam quotes the Pasuk, B'chal d'rachecha da'eyu, you must know Hashem in all of your ways, all of your ways, not just the spiritual stuff that you're doing, but eating, drinking, sexual relations, making money, exercising, traveling. Know Hashem in all of your ways. Very, very beautiful, important <coughs> Rambam in Hilchus Deus. Now the Maral does not quote the Rambam per se, I'm just bringing it in, but the Maral does mention <coughs> that the notion of hey. So it's a different word than the Gemara and Shabbos. The Gemara and Shabbos is portraying Olam Hazah as a very dangerous place, right? Kind of, you're walking on air, like any moment. It's like, I don't know if you do this. I, mean, I, I can't do this. I get, I get vertigo. But you know, sometimes you know, you're walking on the 100th story, and it's a glass floor. And you, know, you really feel like you're, you, know, you just look straight down, like there's no, so, you know, nothing solid. Well, there is something solid, but it looks like there's nothing there. Very, very frightening. 
Well, apparently, Ola Mazar, there actually is nothing there. <laughs> somehow, somehow it's a miracle that we managed to <coughs> get through. So the Gemara in Shabbos is portraying the dangers of Olam Hazeh through the letter He. The letter He is exemplary of the dangers of it. Maral is emphasizing the opportunities of it. Now, this is not a contradiction. Uh, indeed, both of these aspects exist. This is a dangerous place, but it's also a place of infinite opportunities at the same time. Right? This is a Life is a high-risk gamble, so to speak. The returns are enormous, and unfortunately, the potential for loss is also very, very enormous, right? But apparently, and that's why the Gemara says, from a purely mathematical gambling calculus, the Gemara in Erevin says, no achli adam shalom nivra, it might have been better had we not been created. Because Hashem put us into a high-risk gamble. But that's what I would think. But Hashem apparently couldn't agree with that. I mean, obviously, it couldn't be God's perspective, otherwise he wouldn't have done it. Noach Adam, from my perspective, Shalom Nivra, I'd rather not have the problem. But Hashem said, I'm putting you in this game. I don't mean to trivialize it. And, you know, you've got to make the best of it in that way. So it's interesting that you do have the two perspectives. The Gemara in Shabbos is emphasizing how dangerous this world is. Maral is emphasizing how much opportunity there is. And both are emes. Now, one, one, one other interesting point. Um, I'm sure you've heard at a Sheva Brachos, and you will hear at your Sheva Brachos, uh, the famous Gemara in Yevamos, that man and woman have the name of God in them. The man has the Yud, and the woman has the hay. And when there's God in their marriage, the man is a man, what a man is supposed to be, and a woman is what a woman is supposed to be, and everything's wonderful. Take Hashem out of the marriage. Take the Yud and take out the hay. The Gemara Yavama says, you have Esh, fire. They consume each other in their jealousy and their egotism and their selfishness. Right? So when there's God in the marriage, men are men, women are women, everything's great. Take Hashem out of the marriage, you have Esh. Right? Everyone knows this. This is one of the most famous Gemaras. Uh, inevitably, at uh, one or more Sheva Brachos, as you will have, you will hear this Gemara. But the morale is omed on this extra Nakuda. If Yud and He are God's name, why does the man get the Yud and the woman get the He? So morale says, fascinating thing, that men, just like a person with emphysema, has to be on 100% oxygen. A man is much more easily corruptible by the world than a woman. So a man has to kind of create more of a yud existence, disengage a little bit from the physical. Yeshiva, kolel, minyan. Because even if I'm working in the world, even if I'm confronting the world, but the world will drag me down, whether it's testosterone or male ego or whatever it is. So the man needs the, almost the crutch of connecting to the yud. The woman, by her teva, is more uniquely suited to integration, to be able to take holiness and bring it into ordinary life. And in that way, the morale says, when the Torah says a woman is an azer kenegde, a helpmate to her husband, part of that is to bring him to the level of hay. Hay is, hay is a higher level than yud. Because Yud is the level of pure spirituality. Well, it's easier to serve Hashem if I'm not involved in materialism. In fact, that was the Dubner Magid's Muslim Muslim to the Vilna Gaon. Right? Uh, the Dub the Vilna Dubner Magid was a very, very famous Magid and a great, great Talmud Chacham. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been a friend of the Vilna Gaon. And the Vilna Gaon, imagine this assignment, how, how scary it would be. The Vilna Gaon asked the Dubner Magid to come to him and give him a private Muslim Shmuz. Tell me how I, I could correct myself. Tell me how I could be better. The Dubna Magi did not want that assignment. He says, I mean, who, I mean, who am I to tell the Vilna Gaon uh, how he could improve? But the Vilna Gaon insisted that he give him Musser. And the Dubna Magi's Musser was, hey, you're, it's easy for you to serve Hashem. You're not, you're not involved in the world. You're separated from the world. But if you'd have to go out and be involved in Olam Hazar, how righteous do you think you would be? Think about it. 
And it's brought down. The Vilna Gaon was crying. He broke down crying. He says, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <coughs> so the Maral says, men beteva need the Yud, in a sense, to be somewhat disengaged from Olam Hazah, at least some of the time. Women have the koach of the hay, the ability of integration. And part of the Azer Konegdo of marriage is to teach the man that even the physical details of life can also be utilized in a holy way. Now, it is interesting that Yud is double the gematria of He, but that's really the point. When you're living in the purity of a bubble, your feeling of Kedusha can be very intense. When you're living in the world, by definition, there'll be a loss of intensity. So you might figure that's a hefsid, but the answer is no. There may be a loss of intensity, but that actually is the greatest Kiddush Hashem, because you're revealing HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the lowliness of the world. So it's kind of a tragedy. The He is indeed going to be a reduction of the intensity and the enthusiasm, but ultimately it might even be more meaningful in terms of what Hashem wants you to do. Right, so that's the Maral's take. Now again, it, has, uh, it does have nothing to do with the Tomer Devorah, because the Tomer Devora is uh, describing the He from the perspective of the Gemara in Shabbos. Lama Elam Hazad Daim He. And the Maral is going in a different direction. But once again, I think both perspectives are very, very useful because I'm reminded of the dangers and the pitfalls. And I'm also reminded of the great, great, wonderful opportunities that Hashem has put uh, into our lives. Okay, so that's uh, our conclusion of. Yashuv Yerachameinu, and Mir uh, Hashem. Next week uh, we'll continue again. Uh, I'm not necessarily committed to finishing even the first parak uh, before uh, the end of this month. Last week is our last week, so if we carry it over in Elul, that's perfectly fine. In fact, in a way, it's uh, it's almost Tashkacha that we learn Tomer Devora in the month of Elul because that was the minag of the yeshivas in Europe. So you're actually emulating Slobodka and Mir, Kamenetz, Baranovich, in which one of the main Musr Svarim that was learnt in the month of Elul was in fact Tomer Devorah. So I, I have no particular incentive to finish it before the end of this month. But we'll, we'll do two or three more uh, next week. So have a good, uh, good week.